Okay, so I think it's time to start this second session uh, dedicated to uh, domain adaptation and transfer learning. The next speaker will be Yevgen Redko, uh, who is an assistant professor uh, uh, at the Jean Monnet University. Uh, I remind you once again, for those who are just uh, joining us, that you can uh, uh, write your question directly in the chat. And uh, if uh, the answers are simple, uh, uh, Yevgen will, will try to answer them on the fly. Otherwise, we will take a moment, maybe in the middle of the presentation, to answer the, the other questions. Okay, so I leave the floor to, yeah. to Yevgen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the presentation. And it's really nice to be uh... Uh, given a chance to talk about this uh, fascinating topic, at least as as far as I am concerned, as I was working on it for for the last maybe eight nine years. Um, yeah, domain adaptation and transfer learning. So far, we've had uh, a couple of presentations uh, regarding the machine learning, the different scenarios, the uh, different problems that may arise in machine learning when you try to learn a model. The introduction to machine learning made by Max about the understanding of the statistical principles behind the machine learning. Then Charlotte explained you how to deal with the data and how you actually, uh, how you do and train, uh, uh, how you deploy your machine learning models, uh, starting from the very beginning, from gathering the data and, and actually moving forward with that. And then uh, the talk of Framey about the anomaly detection and in general the unbalanced learning in some ways. So I will try to, uh, uh, in this talk, to shift a little bit from the paradigm that they were uh, considering all of them in some way. And this change of paradigm, as you will see, will have very drastic, um, have, will have some drastic co consequences on the learnability in general in this particular framework. So, yeah, so let's start. I try to be more like, uh, I, I'll try uh, to do a presentation that is mass free, so I hope that you will not be disappointed too much by that. I deliberately uh, removed all the equations from it, and I'll try to remain as high level as possible to give you the intuitions, to give you the principles without going too much into the details, um, checking the objective functions and uh, theorems, all this, I, skip, I will skip it all together. So, yeah, I, I will try to really remain uh, high level in that regard. So, okay, let's start. Um, this is uh, the slides for, for my talk, a part of the, of, the, of the lecture that we give to the machine learning and uh, data mining master's degree students at the second year. And uh, the, the current presentation was inspired by the same lecture given by Amory. Uh, so here are some acknowledgments and some sources of the slides uh, uh, for the for the for the content of uh, my slides. Um, yeah, so just if you will have a chance to, if you will have some uh, desire to go through this presentation once again, those are also nice pointers to where you can have uh, the different information used in this presentation. And the different tutorials may be very useful for you. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. So I'll, uh, as Mark started the whole week uh, by positioning machine learning in terms of the general uh, scientific field of the artificial intelligence, I'd like to do it once again today uh, for two reasons, basically. First, because in case of transfer learning, this positioning as part of the much more general uh, artificial intelligence era is very important. In this particular context, you will see that transfer learning is something that is directly uh, related to the ability of achieving something that will look like the artificial intelligence. This is the first reason, and the second reason is because I really like this cartoon. Um, yeah, so artificial intelligence, this is our ultimate goal. People who work in machine learning, and uh, this is how it all started, basically, as I will show in the next slide. The ultimate goal was to build some systems, some automated systems that can learn by exploring the world. So basically, this is one of the cornerstone abilities of a human being to learn and after that to apply this, the learned skills in the everyday life. So as you can guess, probably uh, we're not there yet. It's still pretty far. Uh, well, for many reasons, basically, uh, we are, as, as human beings, we are highly efficient in many tasks uh, that are still out of reach of the scientific understanding. Uh, the way how we, how we are 
Yes, so there is seems to be some issue with the slides. So Luik, I hope that you yeah, okay. Um and it's not easy for many different reasons. Uh, otherwise we would have been uh, uh maybe uh, surrounded by the robots <laughs> and humanoids, something like this. So what do you what a scientific, what a scientist does when he or she cannot solve the general problem? You eventually uh, retreat to some smaller problem and try to reconstruct the larger problem from these intermediate problems. And actually, this intermediate problem, and when we consider the activities of a human being, are those separate tasks that we consider in our that we perform in our everyday life. Those can be some recognition task. Those can be some classification task. We may want to, uh, I don't know, to do some steam understanding, which basically boils down to labeling the, the different objects in the in the image that we see with our eyes. We want to make uh, some recognition, uh, the, the recognition of the handwritten digits, but for instance, some noise data that you want to convert into something when you read the prescription of a, of a doctor, for instance, all those separate small tasks that eventually uh, someone at some point in our in our in the development of the of the field will lead to some to this uh, ultimate goal of achieving artificial intelligence. And all these tasks, uh, when you retreat from the from the big goal to the smaller goals, are basically handled by the machine learning. So everything that was explained so far, uh, those are the ways of dealing with these uh, particularly separated tasks that we will hope to put together at some point and try to. To, to reach something that is much more similar to in the whole to what we represent as human beings. And this solution uh, appears to be highly efficient nowadays. Uh, Mark has told you about many different success stories of machine learning. Maybe every single area uh, of our everyday life is impacted in some way by the, by the machine learning in, why, in one way or the other. So every day we are, we are in very close touch with these machine learning technologies every single time when we see some advertisements, when we take our smartphone out of the pocket, when we look for something on the on the Google, all those uh, techniques that were replaced from some expert systems uh, back in the days by some machine learning models. And all those machine learning models, uh, they basically, uh, uh, they, they proceed in the same way. They, this is uh, the thing that um, the thing that you can see on the bottom of the slide, you have some training data, you have some model, whatever the model is, deep neural networks, uh, support vector machines, uh, some anomaly detection algorithms, as you did, it doesn't matter. You have some model, you train from data, and then you deploy this model on the testing data. So you have uh, the, this box in the middle, and you have the two main ingredients where, that you use to uh, first to run the model and then to certify its performance. Because if you cannot do that, usually you, if you cannot interpret the results, usually there is no point of uh, doing anything. So the two key points of this uh, very simple uh, diagram are the training data and the data data. And so far, everything that we were saying about machine learning made some um, some assumption that we were sliding in, into the into the narrative, but never actually concentrated on this particular assumption. Uh, and we will make it explicit to understand how we will deviate from it in, in my presentation. But first, let's. Uh, so far, from what I explained, machine learning is pretty successful. Everything seems to be awesome. We can solve many different tasks. We can be more efficient than human beings. We can recognize uh, breast cancer better than the doctors, etc. So we can play Go better than the human beings. We can play chess. We can do this and that. We can drive cars. And all this is amazing, and, but the question is uh, whether this is the end, maybe we've reached uh, and we solved all the problems. Well, it appears to be that there are still some open problems related to this uh, traditional paradigm of, uh, of learning uh, from the data uh, using the machine learning. And those are the issues of traditional ML that I cite on this slide. Uh, so the first one is that, uh, as from the talk of uh, Charlotte's talk from yesterday, you've heard that the most advanced machine learning models, they are learned from uh, huge amounts of data. And there are many examples. We don't need to go very far. Uh, my favorite example, I think, is the face recognition technology of Facebook. That was uh, the algorithm that they were using, I think, some, 
some maybe five, six, seven years ago, was trained on uh, four billion images. So four billion images, annotated images. So you can imagine the effort that you need to put into labeling that much data. And uh, there are many other examples. For instance, the game of uh, chess, uh, the alpha, the alpha go. I don't know alpha zero algorithm. I always confuse. No, the yeah, alpha zero algorithm was trained on all the history of the chess uh, since the day when we started actually to record the games of chess. And the algorithm trained on that plus the games that it was playing against itself. So those are the huge amounts of data. <clears throat> and uh, this is essentially is a drawback because uh, in some tasks, like uh, those that I mentioned on these slides in biology and physics, we do not have a chance to ob ob just observe that much data and gather that much data. And on the second, uh, on the other hand, we sometimes cannot label that much data. So, yeah, and in, in general, we cannot, uh, you cannot consider this as a plausible option to actually gather billions of data points and labeling them through some manual effort for every single task that you try to solve. Uh, there exist too many tasks. This is one of the reasons why this would be a very weird option to consider, because if you want to learn uh, image classification uh, model and you have to gather four billion images at every single time, then most likely you're not doing something very intelligent. Maybe that will be very efficient, but if your goal is to reach something that looks like a human being uh, way of dealing with those tasks, then most likely you are far away from that, or there is some there is some uh, mismatch between the concepts of learning as seen from the human points, uh, human beings points of view, and the one that is used in machine learning. And in the end, uh, those tasks, even when you learn uh, your models based on them, they will evolve over time. It's uh, something that happens uh, in for many different reasons. Uh, the technologies evolve. So, for instance, if you learn the, the algorithms on the data back in the 2000, the, in 2006, the images that you were considering for face recognition were not the same as those that you consider now. Um, for instance, for very simple reason, for instance, the smartphones and the cameras on the phones became much more powerful and much more precise. So, all these hints on the fact that simply uh, remaining in this supervised learning paradigm where we gather lots of data, learn models, and move to another task, get lots of data, get lots of data, and learn a new model. It's just not a plausible way of moving forward in, uh, in the future. So what is a plausible way? As you can guess, this is the main topic of today's uh, talk. This is transfer learning. And transfer learning um, in many different flavors, in many different ways. Uh, but with the essential, with the one and single essential goal, which is to extrapolate knowledge to try to use a something that was built for for one application, for one domain, for one task, for some other related application, for some other related data set, for some other related task, because that's essentially what we do. We take what we learned before. Uh, we do not uh, relearn everything from the basics. We try to extrapolate, we try to take something from here and there to put it together, to add something that, uh, to fine tune basically uh, what is missing and to advance with that. That's how we learn. We do not uh, learn from scratch every single time. This is uh, not what we do. And this is why transfer learning actually emerged. Uh, one of the, one of the ways of uh, advancing towards something that looks like more like a human learning, uh, human way of learning. So a very quick uh, example and a very quick definition of uh, what we'll be considering during this talk. This is the famous, uh, the famous story that appeared in 2009, I think, in the very beginning of the whole area of transfer learning, written by Silano Pan, uh, who defined the transfer learning as the ability of the system to recognize and apply knowledge and skills learned in previous domains and tasks to novel domains and tasks. And this uh, definition is extremely general. You can, uh, it's extremely general, yet there are some very, uh, some several key points that will attract your attention. First one is the ability to recognize and apply. So we want to know what can be shared between the two uh, different domains. What can be recognizing the useful knowledge from the one that is not useful, from the one that is harmful and that will uh, lead to something that to, to, to even worse performance than if we were to learn from scratch. 
to apply once again is to find this useful knowledge and to find a way to inject it into our learning in the new domain based on the characteristics of this new domain. And then you have also the fact that we are learning, uh, recognizing and applying knowledge and skills, learning domains and tasks. So on one hand, we have the domains, which means uh, behind that, we basically talk about the data, the data sets, the samples that we deal with and the tasks, the task that can be anomaly detection, that can be classification, that can be regression. All this you can mix just as we do in our everyday life to, uh, to extrapolate the knowledge and to try to learn faster and better and uh, in a more efficient way. So a very simple example of something that, that appears extremely simple for a human being. I have uh, images with a uh, human being on the images and with uh, no human being on the images at horse in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, example. Those are the static images. On the other hand, I have some video frames and I want to solve the same problem, which is the problem of the binary classification of uh, defining whether there is a person in the image or not. And for human being, it appears to be extremely simple. Uh, for the machine learning algorithm, shifting uh, slightly the nature of the data that you consider the modality of the data from images to the video frames uh, can lead to a drastic uh, drop in the performance. Even the most state-of-the-art models can fail because of this uh, slight change that you, as a human being, will not even consider as a change because for you it's basically the same. Uh, so, and this is a, a good example of uh, the kind of problems that we will be dealing today uh, in in many different uh, flavors. Lots. So, why transfer learning? Uh, that's the three or four slides that were intended to attract the attention of uh, the master students uh, uh, because they need some uh, some some explanation of why we will be considering this particular topic and not some other uh, deep learning related stuff that is on the hype everywhere in the media. Uh, this is the slide that is taken from the tutorial of uh, MUNG um, from the, at, uh, the New Rips conference at his keynote talk. And he argued that th there, is, there are many different drivers of the commercial success of machine learning in the, in the industry. One of them, uh, obviously, is the supervised learning. Supervised learning dominates all the successes. This is the, the good old paradigm where we gather lots of the data, we learn on the data, we are highly efficient. And then he puts just behind it, the transfer learning. The transfer learning is a way of uh, uh, transferring all those models that they were learned on these huge data sets to new applications, to new uh, classification tasks, related classification tasks that will allow to save the effort needed to, to do the supervised learning. And behind that, you have unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. I would argue that so far, maybe reinforcement learning, uh, I don't know if it leads to lots of commercial success, but at least it leads to lots of media success as seen uh, from the Alpha Zero and Alpha Go. But anyway, this, this is a projection of how Andrew and G saw the role of transfer learning, not only in the academia, in uh, you know, among the people who deal with some particular problems uh, that may appear to useless to some other people, but in the, in, in the industry, in real world applications of machine learning, and basically in the, in, in the way of how the companies using machine learning make money. This is what he said. Um, this is one, one opinion that you, uh, from, from the guy who is pretty famous in the area, and I think it, it's worse, uh, it, it's worth mentioning it, and it's worth maybe listening to to somebody who is on the scene in machine learning since uh, since a very very long time and was considered largely as a visionary of the machine learning field. The second <laughs> opinion about transfer learning is directly related to what I've started from, uh, and this is a, the, the the quote from the Demis Hasabis, the CEO of DeepMind. Uh, the DeepMind that Mark mentioned in the first talk, the DeepMind that uh, solved the uh, protein folding problem, the uh, chess playing problem, the goal playing problem, and many other <laughs> impressive results. So uh, he thinks that transfer learning is the key to general intelligence. And the key to doing transfer learning will be the acquisition of conceptual knowledge that is abstracted away from the perceptual details of where you learn it from. This is a very complicated and overcomplicated maybe uh, quote, but it boils down to the fact that somehow when you learn 
if you want to move towards the general artificial intelligence, you'll have to find a way to 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 find the quintessence of the knowledge and to carry it on and to try to apply it to new tasks and uh, without the need of this uh, once again uh, uh, I would say uh, supervised learning uh, where you start learning from scratch every single model on the new data set. This is uh, one more important opinion that one may uh, want to, to hear about the transfer learning and its importance in the machine learning field. So I hope that at this point, uh, two smart guys told you that um, if you consider me a smart guy, then three. <laughs> so uh, there are at least three people uh, who, who, uh, who explain in this, uh, in this quote why transfer learning is that important and why it was important to include this particular talk to the money text late. Uh, Money text late special session number six. Okay, so this is this was the motivation introduction uh, part of this talk. Uh, in some way, it was the beginning of the introduction and the motivation part of this talk. I'll I'll stick to this outline uh, for the rest of the talk. Uh, I will continue giving you the real world examples and uh, uh, trying to explain to you what are the particular differences between the supervised learning that I mentioned many times before. And the transfer learning, and and then we will uh, finish this part, the first part, with uh, many different examples, uh, real world examples of where we use transfer learning, where uh, the, the more or less the most famous examples that I've picked up here. Many others can be uh, can be found in the literature. Um, uh, the second part will, will be about the understanding the domain adaptation problem, the transfer learning domain adaptation problem that we will define. Um, why is this is important? Because usually when you try to come up with some algorithm to do uh, some to, to achieve some particular goal, you usually need some guidance. And in this particular case, the guidance comes from the fact that we want to understand uh, what changes uh, in, the, in the fact of transfer learning when we compare it to the supervised learning uh, problem. Mark told you about the generalization bounds, about the theoretical guarantees. And how they suggest that you need to find a certain trade off between certain quantities, how you can do that. Uh, we will do the same with respect to the domain adaptation to try to understand uh, what will be the principal way of solving this problem suggested by, uh, by some theoretical insights. After that, only after that, I'll switch to the algorithms. Um, those will be some, uh, a very non exhaustive list of the algorithms. I could not even attempt to. to to, to give you the whole picture and the whole overview of all the algorithms that exist, because there are just too many of them and it would not be tractable even in one week, I think. I'll just give a couple of hints to the most famous algorithms, uh, to my personal favorites, and I think Mark will be, uh, will be mentioning some other algorithms uh, later today uh, related to the optimal transport. And finally, I'll finish with a real world example of, uh, of a medical imaging problem uh, where transfer learning was used uh, that I had the chance to work on with uh, uh, one of the postdocs from the Uber Korean laboratory uh, when I was still at Kaitis. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it's a good illustration of why transfer learning can be uh, useful in the in uh, medical uh, imaging applications. Okay, so let's start. Intuition and motivation. Uh, Domain adaptation and transfer learning, uh, I'll be uh, uh, just, I'll be using those two terms interchangeably, but I'll explain the domain adaptation term uh, a little bit later in a couple of slides. So I'll just, uh, let's say transfer learning so far. Transfer learning um, majorly appeared in computer vision applications. Uh, I think that's uh, how it historically happened. Uh, there were no, maybe two different, two different areas, which will be the natural language processing and the computer vision. So in the computer vision, what, what happens is that people started to ask themselves the sort of questions of what will happen if we learn our huge deep neural network, some, some uh, AlexNet, for instance, that is, uh, has some impressive results on ImageNet, what will happen if we try to use this neural network on some other benchmark data sets? So those data sets may, for instance, have the same classes. They may uh, contain this, the images uh, that portray the same, the same object. So what will happen in this case? For instance, a very common example considered in the transfer learning literature is that 
the images from Amazon. So the, in this case, those are the screens and the images of the screens of the actual screens taken by some uh, uh, by the web camera, uh, web camera or some DSLR camera. So on, on the one hand, you have the images from the Amazon, all the products are very neat, they're well positioned, they, they, are, they, they have very, no background at all. On the other hand, you have the somewhat messy images from, the, from somebody's office with some random objects behind the screen. So once again, for a human being, if I were to, to show you the images of these screens and I were to ask you to classify this image, it would have, it would uh, pose you exactly no problem. You would say, well, this is just a screen. What people uh, <clears throat> what people noticed actually first that there was this idea of uh, considering this task, uh, for instance, in the paper at SVPR conference, which is the a famous conference in computer vision domain, where this goal was stated uh, as what would happen if you train the classifiers on the Flickr photos, or Amazon photos, and Will they work well on the mobile camera images? And the answer to that was actually uh, given in many other papers. The answer was uh, partly negative, and uh, I would rather even say that uh, rather negative because every single time when you slightly change the nature of the test data that you consider in this application, for instance, when you shift from the Flickr photos to the mobile camera images, you, you will observe a significant uh, drop in terms of the performance. Those uh, huge models trained on billions of images, uh, somehow they were not able to, to handle such a, such a tiny shift in terms of the data representation. And that's puzzling because that's not something that you want to tackle once again to, 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 to collect those the data once again, to run those huge models weeks on the road once again, you just think that uh, it appears to be a very time consuming and unnecessary effort. And what happens behind that is that actually those kind of uh, uh, representation shifts, they're very frequent in computer vision. And uh, one of the reasons why is that the case is for instance that uh, for those who are familiar with computer vision, you know that uh, images they, they usually they are usually represented uh, using different features. Uh, those features can be extracted based on some key points characteristics where you try to uh, find the, the coordinates of the most what we will call the key points in the image, and that can be done in a different way in very in many different ways. For instance, like using the surf features or using the sift features. So one simple reason why this change of the uh, training to the testing uh, data that have a significant shift in them can be problematic is simply because when you use different feature extraction techniques, you end up having the, vec the feature vectors of different sizes. Even beyond talking about this uh, shift in terms of the representation of the data, uh, of how well the objects are posed, even if you take the same objects and you apply different feature extraction characteristics, you will end up having the vectors of different size and you will not be able simply to apply your machine learning model to in this case uh, if you train them on the surf features and you'll want to make predictions on the six features for instance <clears throat> and there are many different reasons why we can keep on uh, adding them to the list uh, the differences between the high quality and low quality images uh, something that was mentioned yesterday for instance uh, during the talk on the super resolution uh, the differences in styles between the daylight and the sunset images, those also are some very different statistical characteristics and will lead to a drop in the performance. Then you have this pose then in the wild objects, something that once again we can encounter very frequently in the practice where we will be uh, training the model on some clean and neat data and then we want to make it some predictions in the in the wild, in the real world, like for instance with uh, self-driving vehicles, where you can learn them uh, in, the, in some in controlled environment, and then you'll just leave them drive on the streets where everything is a little bit messy, a little bit more noisy. And in the end, yes, you have uh, same the same sort of style shift where you have the RT objects uh, like the cars, uh, some neat photographs, and you have the video surveillance. We have the same car somewhere in the dark under the tree, and so all this is about uh, deviating from the usual paradigm of supervised learning. Because in this case, uh, we we perturb the statistical characteristics 
of the test data to make them different from the those characteristics in the in the change data, and we end up having a classifier that is not fit to to make good predictions on this new data. And we can go on with those examples. There are so many of them, but uh, that uh, you will have to reserve a week, I think, to, to go through all of them. I'll just give those that are the most popular ones. I mean, natural language processing, for instance, and part of speech tagging. Uh, you may want to learn uh, parts of speech tagger on, uh, on the text corpora from the bi biomedical journals, and you will want to apply it to the text corpora from the financial journals, for instance. Uh, and you can see that the, the parts of words will be exactly the same, but the context in which they appear will be very, very different. Uh, and this, once again, will well, we'll try to represent uh, using some embedding techniques, for instance, uh, the, those uh, those tokens, you will have a very different context in which they appear. And most likely, the classifier, the part of speech tagger learned from biomedical uh, journals will not fit to the classifier uh, that you will that to, will not fit to the data from the financial text. Spam detection. Uh, if you go to the Wikipedia on transfer running, this will be the the most famous example of. Uh, of the of the transfer, I mean, you have uh, your personal mailbox, you have your professional mailbox. So you, the emails that you receive are very different, on, and what is considered spam between your professional email box and your personal email box will be extremely different. Uh, for instance, your personal email box, you will receive lots of uh, uh, images uh, and also some attachments uh, with photos, with videos. Your professional mailbox will consider all those most likely as a spam, uh, but your personal mailbox that would be uh, per 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 perfectly normal uh, emails for you. So how would you do in this case uh, if you try to learn a spam filter and on on your professional correspondence and then try to apply it in your uh, personal correspondence? Then there will be a very important shift between the semantics of what is considered to be a spam in the two cases. And once again, it will not. Uh, most likely, if there is no uh, extra fine tuning involved, it will not work well when you just simply shift from the professional to the personal uh, mailboxes. Sentiment analysis, once again, related to the natural language processing, uh, adapt the classifier predicting the preferences for books to those of DVDs. Uh, once again, you have four different domains, for instance, the different articles that are being sold and your company wants to know whether the reviews are good or bad to sort of uh, uh, to put them uh, some rating, uh, four stars out of five or something like this. And you do not want to relearn your classifier for every single article. Uh, that in this particular case, it appears to be ridiculously expensive. So what you want to do is to learn it for books and to apply it for DVDs, for instance. So what will happen in this case is that uh, you, once again, you have an important semantic shift between the two domains. On, on, on the one hand, if you consider the electronic uh, uh, devices, so you will have some uh, very particular words that will reflect the positive attitude of the review, uh, while th those same words will not be applicable in the, in the other domain. For instance, in terms of the electronics, the word compact may be, uh, may be a good feature that tells you that the product is actually good. In terms of the video games, it's, it's something that you will not uh, actually use to describe the, the fact that the video game was good or not. Uh, but there are some other games, uh, there, there, are some, there are some other words that are domain independent, for instance, like good, excited, nice, never buy, unhappy. Uh, regardless of the domain that you're considering, those two will uh, have the exact semantic meaning. And this brings us to what I was insisting on in the very beginning, in the in the very beginning of the presentation about the, the ability to recognize and apply the knowledge. So, in fact, here the, recognize, the recognition part would be to spot those uh, domain invariant um, words and to try to take them into account. So this sort of builds up to give you a hint of how the domain, uh, the transfer learning algorithms will proceed in the end. And this uh, something that will be perfectly reflected by the actual practice of uh, transfer learning. 
And the final, uh, the final uh, application that I wanted to mention is something that uh, many physicists, I think, um, people working on, uh, on on those kind of applications where you have uh, a very uh, um, well behaving controlled environment where you can make lots of different tests, uh, when you can uh, try lots of different uh, ways of making the, the you know. Um, uh, I would say, yeah, the simulated environment basically it allows you to play with the, with some process to get the results, and then you want to to see what happens to learn some policy based on that, to learn some classifiers, some model, no matter what, and then you want to deploy it in the real world environment. So those, all those simulations that you've done, in the, as you can see on the left here, those are just the computer simulations. On the right, you have the actual robot. You have the, the same object. And this is something that we call the sim to real, uh, sim to real adaptation, uh, where one of the most uh, important examples of the transfer learning nowadays, especially in the robotics, where you have uh, the simulation environment once again that allows you to gather lots of data, learn a good model, and then you just put your robot out there in the wild, and uh, and you want to make it at least as good and to, to try to. To, to apply what is applicable in the real world and uh, in the best way possible. So those are the real world applications of transfer learning. I hope that you are convinced now that it's a, uh, very promising, not only from the academic point of view, but also from the industrial point of view area of research. Uh, and ha that has now very, very straightforward um, implications uh, in, the, in the practice of machine learning. Many other applications can be uh, mentioned here, like the speech recognition, the medicine, something that I'll come back to later in the in the end of this presentation, the biology, uh, time series adaptation, Wi-Fi localization, all those applications. Uh, I would go as far as to say that any single time when you learn a model and you uh, and you redeploy it after some after some time, you'll encounter those uh, shifts in terms of the data behavior that will lead you to the necessity of considering the data, the transfer learning algorithms. So this will be my bottom line for this part. And uh, telling you that uh, whatever the application is, uh, the fact that the data evolves and, uh, and, and <clears throat> will lead you to the necessity of considering transfer learning at one point or the other. Okay, this was oh, wait. Uh, yeah, this was the motivation part. I don't know how uh, if there is a strict distinction between the two. So now let's uh, shift to the actual differences between the supervised learning and the transfer learning to understand what 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 all this refers to, all these shifts and all these differences and all the similarities and the invariances that I was talking about. So a very uh, simple explanation: uh, supervised learning. You have this. Uh, cloud of stars and you train, this is your training data, and you have a cloud of stars, this is your test data. Uh, you say that you draw uh, those data from the same domain. Uh, but by the domain, you mean uh, a probability distribution, whether it is will be a, a joint probability distribution over the instance output space, or just the marginal distribution over the instances. In this case, this is these are the instances. And there is transfer learning. So you have some other weird shapes, very basic explanation. This is your training data. You move to the test data. Those are very different. Uh, and you want to figure out a way of uh, actually dealing, them, uh, dealing with this shift. So if, from this slide, uh, from now on, you can see that uh, when we talk about the test and training data coming from the same domain, we refer to the fact that this data is drawn uh, are drawn from the some probability distribution. And when we say that the training and test data are from different domains, we refer to the fact that training and test data are drawn from the different probability distributions. This is the key, uh, di the key difference uh, between transfer learning and everything that uh, was explained so far. Uh, up, to, up to this point, we were considering the training and test data drawn under the assumption that it is drawn from the same probability distribution. So you have uh, the domains that are modeled as probability distributions. You can just think about it, like when I try to explain it, I think about the data as some finite set of, uh, of, of the representatives of 
for instance, cats and dogs that you have. And the probability distribution, uh, if it's hard to you, for you to think about it in the general terms, just think about it as all the cats and dogs on the in the universe. Uh, and this is what the probability distribution is. Uh, yeah, and th then there is this task associated to a domain. Uh, the fact that you want to do something with this data, uh, you want to do classification, uh, you want to do regression, you want to do clustering, you want to do anomaly detection, no matter what. The tasks englobes the fact that you have some output space, something to predict, and the prediction itself, the function, the sort of function that you will, will look for. Is that it, it will be a function that will predict one category out of uh, 10 categories or one value out of the finite set of values or something like this. The goal of transfer learning will be extremely simple. All those definitions, all those, all, all those examples boil down to the fact that we want to improve the target predictive function, the one that we learn for the test data that is the target domain, which is uh, our test data using the knowledge from the source domain. So, um, from now on, we will be referring to the training data as a source data and to the test data as a target data. We want to extrapolate the knowledge from the source data and adapt it to the target data. Uh, transfer learning is extremely vast, and there are many different flavors that, that I mentioned so far, and those are only the uh, this is a taxonomy that dates back to the 90 year, to, not, not 90, but 2009. 2010 uh, by in from sorry of Fun and Young, but actually uh, when we are talking about meta learning, lifelong learning, continuous learning, all those are parts of the transfer learning in one way or the other. So all those uh, new paradigms that uh, that induce lots of hype in the in the, the machine learning uh, community, all those are referring back to the ability of uh, sort of move on and carry on knowledge. That is abstracted from the way of where you learn it, just as Demis Hassabi said. In this particular talk, we will be uh, concentrating on this, on the domain adaptation, the one that is uh, in the red square. Uh, the assumption there is that you do not have the same distribution of the data, but still you want to solve the same task. And when I say the same task, it means that I will have the same output space. And I'll be solving the same task in terms of the nature of the task, in terms of the function that I'll be looking for. Whether it's regression or classification, it will be the same between the two domains. This is a part of what we call the transductive transfer learning, because we didn't have, we will be considering the fact that we do not have labels in the target domain. Otherwise, uh, it's maybe a, not that uh, useful. Our, idea, our goal would be to use a huge uh, label uh, sample from the source domain to learn something in the target domain where we have no labels. This is what we will focus on. Uh, it all boils down to asking the question, uh, how can we learn using label data from a source distribution, a low error classifier for another related target distribution? So you can replace the name distribution by, by, by the domain. You can replace the name, the word domain by the, by the sample. Uh, the idea will be the same, learn the classifier from test uh, from the source uh, samples to apply it further on the target sample uh, where the two are not drawn from the same distribution. Uh, some notations just to quickly uh, differentiate between two very important notions that we will be considering. <clears throat> just a quick reminder of what we we call the input space X. Uh, the data that we uh, consider the output space are basically our labels. Uh, when we talk about domain, we can talk about it in two different ways, whether we will be referring to the distribution over the inputs and the outputs, or we will be talking about the distribution only of the inputs. In this case, we will be using the, the name, the marginal distribution denoted by D and the joint distribution denoted by P. We'll have some class of models, uh, which can be any learning uh, algorithm, basically uh, SVN, deep neural networks, etc. And we'll be referring to the notion of the error uh, that Mark introduced uh, yesterday. This is just how many mistakes do we make when we uh, deploy our classifier. So given this, uh, these notations, we'll be uh, looking for a function from, uh, from the class of models that we consider that, have, uh, that, that has a small error in the target domain. By considering the data from the source domain, uh, Label data because I'm, I refer here to the 
to the PS, the distribution PS, uh, and the data from the target domain that is unlabeled, only from the marginal distribution. Uh, this is our goal. If you formalize it, uh, the goal of domain adaptation, so we switch from uh, the general transfer learning setting to the a more particular, uh, arguably uh, the most popular setting, which is the setting of domain adaptation. Uh, this uh, mismatch between the distributions that you are mentioning can uh, also have many different flavors. So basically, uh, if you know the, uh, if you know the, if you follow some course on the statistics, you know that uh, the joint distribution can be written as the product of the marginal distribution times the conditional distribution, and the way of how you interpret the inequality between the joint distributions can lead to many different scenarios in transfer learning and in domain adaptation. For instance, one of the common scenarios is the covariate shift, where there is only the shift in the marginal distributions between the data, but the conditional distributions remain the same. So this is most, one of the most popular scenarios, and uh, even though it's not very truthful, as the conditional distributions may differ in practice. Uh, you also have the target shift. I'll be just going quickly through those, because uh, just to let you know that dominant adaptation is not only about uh, the change in the marginal distributions. You have the same situation, but in this time you have the imbalance between the classes in the source distribution and the target distribution. Uh, once again, it's closely related to what uh, Remy was talking in, in some way <coughs> during the previous talk. Occurs in many real world applications uh, with imbalanced data, where for some reason uh, you build your model on the data that was balanced and then you deploy it on some hugely uh, biased data in terms of the representative of the classes. Um, not many contributions in the literature in case you want to find something to work on, uh, and it assumes the same distribution of the inputs in, in some way. <coughs> so one good example of that uh, is a remote sensing application where you learn to recognize the different parts of the landscape. For instance, if you are in the city, uh, then you'll have lots of roads, lots of buildings, uh, you build a classifier on that from the satellite images, and then you move to the countryside, to the mountains, where you have uh, scarcely any house, any buildings, uh, any roads at all, uh, but you have lots of forests, lots of rivers, and then your classifier will basically fail. Uh, and this is one of the, also one of the, uh, one of the transfer learning problems. How you deal with that when you want to adapt the the, the mismatch in terms of the proportions of the classes. So in some way, this is also a transfer learning problem. And there are some other more exotic uh, ways of uh, considering the transfer learning problem. For instance, the sample selection bias. I just mentioned them for you uh, to be aware of them. I will only be not talking and going into the details about those. Um, yeah, so this is our problem setup. I have uh, some data. I have labels uh, in the source uh, domain, for instance, if in this case, those are the classes, uh, the, the backpacks and bikes. I have the target domain. I have no labels there. And my decision function that I build in the source domain is not fit for my target domain because the distributions of those uh, two are very different. How would I deal with that? This is our major question. And it leads actually to, uh, to three other questions that we need to answer before actually considering some practical ways of how so to solve this problem, the domain adaptation problem. First one of them is what does it mean to, uh, uh, what does it mean to the, the, the shift between the distributions? Uh, what does it mean similar? What does it mean related? How do you measure that uh, in, some, in some formal and some principal way? So this will be the first question that we will be trying to answer. Second question is uh, when the domain adaptation is provably efficient. I know that I cannot control my target error just as uh, Mark couldn't control his uh, true error yesterday and he was bound in it by something that he can control in practice. How would I do the same in the domain adaptation? What will be the intuition? Because we know that the intuition about the, uh, the supervised learning leads to some practical algorithms. How would we proceed here? Uh, third question, based on the previous result, are there any pitfalls of the domain adaptation? Is there, are there any cases where we cannot adapt actually? And this is one major and striking difference with respect to the supervised learning is that there are uh, 
uh, the spoiler is that there are pit some pitfalls of the dominant adaptation where whatever you may do, uh, you will still fail and you will not be able to adapt. And this seems very um, intuitive because in some particular cases, you may have this semantic shift between the, the domains that will not allow you, they will be so unrelated that it will, uh, uh, not, that it will restrict you from uh, adapting uh, successfully. And finally, how to design new algorithms based on all this, taking into account the proper measure of similarity, taking into account the theoretical guidance, and taking into account the pitfalls of dominant adaptation that we will be seeing uh, in the following slides. Okay, so I'm running a little bit late. I'll try to, uh, I took lots of time to, uh, to explain that. So this part is very important as I will try to explain the intuition behind the dominant adaptation problem and how it can be solved in practice uh, based on some uh, formal ideas. <clears throat> a quick recall from uh, the yesterday's lecture uh, in supervised learning, where our sample uh, S that we consider for learning comes from some distribution, we want to know what will be the classification error over the whole distribution. We want to relate it to, in some way to the classification error of the sample that we have. Uh, this is a learning bound. We control the error of the, over the whole distribution by the error over the sample plus the ratio between the complexity of the model and the size of the learning sample. Uh, this suggests a very natural, natural way to proceed to learn, which is to minimize the error over the given sample, whatever the model is, the SVM, the neural networks, and to find a good trade-off between the complexity of the learned model uh, that you consider and the size of the data set. Just as Charlotte explained yesterday, have lots of data, you can opt for some uh, options like uh, for data-hungry options like deep neural networks. If you have less data, maybe uh, not Try not to go there because you will, the, the ratio you know, in the second term will hinder the, the control over the, the classification error of, over the test sample. So this is a very natural way of uh, considering the supervised learning problem. You have this bound and you minimize the two terms and you try to, to proceed in, in this way. So what happens in dominant notation? First observation is that the source sample uh, is not drawn from the same distribution as the target one. So we cannot no more relate the true error to the error over the sample because the sample is not drawn from the same distribution. So this is one major statistical difference between the transfer learning and everything that was explained so far is that we do not have this assumption. We just uh, we violate it and we want to deal with it. And this is our major problem in domain adaptation. And yet, if we consider the intuition behind the annotation problem, we can say that it should uh, reduce to the traditional supervised learning when the two distributions are the same. When uh, my source sample uh, is drawn from the distributions that becomes closer and closer to the to the distribution that I uh, over the which I try to bound the risk, I should be converging to the to this typical guarantee from the traditional supervised learning. So one way of uh, portraying this intuition is to say that I'll be having the exact same guarantee and you can see that I don't know why <clears throat> but I don't have this wait <clears throat> so this uh, yeah Yeah, okay, uh, I'll try to explain it in a different way. Uh, this the classification error in the source domain is is exactly the, the two terms that we've seen before on the previous slide. That was a classification error over the sample that you consider plus, uh, plus the ratio between the complexity and the size of the sample. And to make it uh, follow the, the intuition that we have about the domain adaptation and supervised learning, we have this term, which is the distance between the source and the target domains. Uh, so, if that uh, becomes smaller and smaller, then uh, we uh, retrieve our traditional supervised learning guarantee. And it, uh, in some way, it makes sense. This is uh, how you would identify the way of gene transfer learning. You would try to uh, have this uh, uh, relationship between the source and target domain that you want to make stronger and stronger to make the problem converge to traditional supervised learning problem. So this suggests a very simple algorithm, uh, minimizing the error in the source domain, just as you know how to do it uh, now after the two or uh, three, three talks uh, so far. 
plus making the two domains as similar as possible. Minimize the distance between the two domains and then maintain a low classification error in the search domain. So everything uh, seems to be really good. Uh, we have a very practical idea of how to deal with this. The question that remains actually is uh, what a distance means here. So how do you define a distance between the source and the target domains? There are multiple ways of how that can be done. I'll mention a couple of those. Uh, and apart from that, what are the pitfalls, uh, if any, of this domain adaptation problem? So, so far, it seems that it can be solved just as a supervised learning problem by finding some trade-off between the size of the sample, the complexity of the model, and efficient way of learning from the finite uh, size data. Is it the case here? Uh, can we claim that the domain adaptation problem can always be solved? We can always find an efficient way of transferring the knowledge from one domain to the other. And uh, this is a very interesting question because so far it appears that we can do that. Uh, and I'll argue that we cannot. Uh, this is something that goes uh, contrary to what we've seen so far. So first take, how I define the distance over uh, between the two domains. I'll try to compare their distributions, which is, seems to be uh, the most uh, easiest way of how to deal with this, uh, uh, how to define this term. I'll take the joint distribution in the source domain, joint distribution in the target domain. I'll take the samples, the labeled samples, uh, and I'll calculate some sort of a distance between them. Total variation, Wasserstein distance, schoolback laser, no matter what. But the problem with that is that I do not have the joint distribution in the target domain. I do not have any labels. And, uh, and this actually uh, invalidates this idea. My second take would be to say, well, I have the marginal distributions. So let, let me just take the marginal distributions. I'll compare them in the same way. I'll take those total variation, Wasserstein, kurbach labor divergence, you name it. And I'll be just calculating the empirical estimation of, of, of the difference between the marginal distribution of two domains. And I'll use this as a similarity measure that I will be minimizing. Well, that's a very sound idea. People do exactly that in, in transfer learning. Uh, you can also often estimate those distances uh, between the marginal distribution from the data. You do not need labels for that. Um, you can minimize them. You can parameterize them to uh, find some transformation that minimizes the distance, the distance or the diversion that you consider. And this is a perfectly good way of uh, defining the distance between the two domains. Except for one but, which is that you lose the information on the conditional distribution. Basically, you, you lose the information of how the data was labeled in the first place. And this is something that obviously you will have to sacrifice because you do not know what are the labels in the target domain. You cannot estimate those conditional distributions. And this leads to the to the very nice decomposition of the of the of the distance between the source and target domains. On one hand, on one hand, you have uh, the distance between the labeled samples, the marginal distributions. On the other hand, you have this mismatch between the labeling process, uh, which in this case we will define according to the theory of the transfer learning as the error of the best classifier in two domains. So how you should think about it is that if I manage to find one classifier that is good for both domains, then it means that there is some uh, model that can be good for both models uh, in, in some way. And I, it, it is meaningful to try to find this model, to learn it on the source domain, and then apply it on the target domain. In this case, the guidance that I need to find this best model would be the, uh, the distance between the unlabeled samples. I'll try to put them closer, and I will hope that I will find some, uh, some representation for which there will be a classifier that will be good for both of them. And this is exactly uh, the, the, this is actually the essence of transfer learning. In this very slide, in this very inequality, you control uh, what you want to predict in the target domain uh, by its three terms. Two of them you can actually minimize. Just in the supervised learning, uh, you can minimize the two terms in the bounds. Uh, there in the source domain, uh, I have labeled data, so it's absolutely fine. I can minimize that. I can minimize the distance between source and target on labeled samples, but I cannot control the third term because I do not have labels and I cannot estimate what is the labeling function in the target domain. And this is the very uh, funny thing about transfer learning is that this lack of control over the last term uh, hinders in some sometimes the performance of the algorithms and uh, of the transfer learning algorithms. And you basically have nothing to do about it. It will just happen sometimes. 
And the example that I found for, to illustrate this may be a little bit weird, but those are, uh, this is the best example <laughs> so far that I could find to illustrate the fact that uh, sometimes there is no good classifier for two domains. So consider these two images. Uh, for you, probably they look to uh, both of them look like the salmon fillets, right? On the left, it's a salmon fillet, and on the right, it's a salmon fillet. They're just basically a piece of uh, a piece of fish, right? <clears throat> but actually, so if I want to uh, consider those images on the left as my source domain, and those images on the right as my target domain, you would say that uh, it probably should be fine. You can learn something on the left, trans transfer it on the right, and it will work nicely. Except for the fact that the image on the left, I found it on the Lee Express, and it's uh, a pillow. It's not a part of the fish. And it's actually people sleep on that for whatever reason. You, I don't know. <clears throat> and the image on the right is actually a part of the fish. So, the, given the fact that the representation of the data remains extremely, extremely uh, close in these two cases, there will be no classifier that will be able to say that it's both a, pill, a, a pillow and a fish at the same time. So this is a very weird example that illustrates that there will be no good classifier. With, uh, the best classifier with low, with, for both domains will have a high error because of the semantic mismatch between the two domains. And this is exactly, uh, in some way, it follows the intuition about the transfer learning problem. You cannot hope to transfer from something uh, to something if the, these two uh, domains are completely unrelated, like the uh, the fact that you want to predict two different entities for two exactly similar uh, objects. And this is what we call the the possibility of domain adaptation or the impossibility of domain adaptation. The fact that in some cases the adaptation in the unsupervised scenario where you have no labels in the target domain is not possible. And period. This is basically uh, the bottom line of it. <clears throat> so a quick summary, uh, domain adaptation uh, equals to the mismatch between the training and test distributions in terms of the uh, data generating uh, uh, characteristics. Common approach, minimizing, controlling the bound that we've derived, aligning the marginal distributions, the only information that you have, plus keeping the source error low. Once again, something that you know how to do uh, with machine learning methods. Second, third takeaway, may the domain adaptation problem, the fact of aligning to, to samples, to distributions may fail when there is no semantic relationship between the two domains, or when the semantic relationship is, uh, uh, goes on the contrary between the two domains. So as it was put by uh, the authors of the papers that I was mentioning, when there is no classifier that is good for both domains, then we cannot opt to find a good target model by training only on the source domain. And this is a funny fact about transfer. It may fail, and there is nothing to do about it. You cannot find the right trade off between the complexity, the size of the sample. This is just, in this case, this is not an option. It will not work. <clears throat> so, if you have any questions, so far, no questions. So, uh, maybe it was not as easy as I thought <laughs> for you to follow. But yeah, let me know. We can make a short break here. Otherwise, I'll just keep on going. Okay, now let's just continue. Several famous approaches. I'll, I think I'll just, what I'll be presenting here is a very, <clears throat> um, other very basic approaches to transfer learning. Uh, more evolved approaches can be, uh, can be found in the literature, obviously. Those are just the, probably the first hand choices if you were to tackle a transfer learning problem, if you were to know that there is a shift between the training and test data in, in your data set, in your, in your application. Uh, just to, to, to remind you that uh, from the very beginning, I was referring to this uh, famous example of the Amazon and uh, webcam images. So in what follows, I'll be using this benchmark data set as, as a reference to show you some results from the papers on domain adaptation to show you how it works in practice and what kind of improvement you achieve when you deal with this uh, shift between the training and test distributions. So the office can take that and said uh, the same task, classifying the images into 10 different classes. 
um, four different domains, Amazon images, uh, high quality images, low quality images, and the images from the Caltech data set. The adaptation goes from one domain to the other, for instance, from Amazon to Caltech. Uh, in the tables, it will be written, in this case, Amazon to Caltech, meaning that I am learning a classifier on Amazon and I am deploying it on Caltech. <coughs> Uh, first approach, a uh, no approach approach, which is basically a no transfer learning approach. One of the earliest hints on the fact that deep neural networks actually learn something that is invariant uh, from the different shifts that may occur in the images. So the idea was extremely uh, simple. It was actually not even a transfer learning method, but it, it is worth mentioning it here because sometimes for small shifts, you don't actually need no particular um, uh, aligning strategy of to, to bridge the two domains together. You can just run your data through a network that was pre-trained pre on some huge imaging data set like ImageNet, for instance, and that's what the authors of, the, of this paper uh, uh, <clears throat> have done. Uh, what they done after that is that they extracted the features from the two last layers before the classification layer, and they've seen that Whatever the domain is, Amazon, Caltech, DSLR, Webcam, the images when represented this using these good feature representations from the deep neural network, they sort of look very similar. They are grouped together according to their labels. So they have the representations that are well aligned, which is a very good starting point to start to deal with this. So what you do after that, uh, you know that uh, the features learned by the neural networks are somewhat invariant to the two domains. For the two domains, then you just fit a classifier on source domain and you apply it to the target domain. And it's uh, a no transfer learning approach, but it actually leads to a uh, to, to performance gap of uh, around 40% when you consider uh, the first <coughs> works on this data set that used uh, shallow features, which were the SOAR features, the key point detectors. Uh, just to show you some results, you can see that uh, Amazon Webcam. You use SOAR features, logistic regression, and SVM uh, fail uh, rather than miserably when you learn from the from the source domain, for instance. So when you try to uh, <clears throat> when you try to do the same, uh, uh, yeah, I think this is the transfer learning baseline ST. So when you, you simply use the invariant features learned by the decaf, somewhat invariant features uh, learned by the the proposed architecture. You actually uh, reach a performance improvement of some 40-50% instantly from that. So this is not a transfer learning approach. This is not a dominant adaptation approach, but in some way it can be seen as a good starting point to deal with the uh, dominant adaptation. Uh, if the shift in terms of the considered, if the shift in the data that you consider is not uh, is not huge, it's sort of like some small changes. Not that much. You can simply do that. Second idea is something that is uh, quite often <clears throat> used in the pattern learning, continuous learning. Those ideas where you try to learn in continuous way is to take a huge neural network once again, train on ImageNet, uh, just as we've done before. But this time, we do not take simply the feature representations learned by the neural network, but we'll try to freeze the network up, up up until to some point and we'll try to learn or relearn only the last couple of layers for instance to uh, like in this case if you have a small data set with few classes uh, you do not have enough data to learn the parameters of the or re relearn the parameters of uh, four or five layers for instance because the problem will become over parameterized so you'll just freeze all the network up until to the classification layer just as Sherlock mentioned yesterday and you simply simply retrain that uh, on the data that you have. If you have a little bit a little bit more data, then you can even consider retraining the couple of last uh, layers to because if you have enough data compared to the number of the parameters that you need to learn in those last layers, then you can do that perfectly well as well. So bigger data sets, freezing less layers, um, learning more layers, and with all keeping the ratio between the complexity of the model and the size of the sample at a good level. <clears throat> so yeah, this is the second approach that is often called the fine tuning approach, where you freeze some part of the network and you simply retrain the last layer. And there are many variations to that. Sometimes you don't even 
uh, retrain the network. Sometimes you can do some you know, solve this problem in a closed form by uh, considering the regression uh, over the last layer, etc. So this is one of the most common approaches I think uh, known to the public uh, and uh, labeled as transfer learning approach in deep learning. Some hints of how that can be done. You know that the features learned by the neural networks they become more and more specific uh, when you. Uh, move further up uh, the layers in the network. So this defines on how many layers in some way you need to freeze and how many layers you should retrain. Uh, this small table from the lectures from Stanford University summarizes it pretty well. If you have a uh, small shift, a uh, little data, just retrain the linear classifier on top layer. If you have very similar data set, quite a lot, quite a lot of data, then you take a couple of more layers to to learn, and etc. <clears throat> um, yeah. So if the, you have very little data and very different data set, obviously the shift becomes much harder. You need you need some particular job to be done about this, and this is, will be the, the third contribution that I would like to present to you today. Is arguably one of the most uh, one of the strongest baselines in domain adaptation, which is the uh, adversarial strategy. So this is a very beautiful idea. <coughs> I think that, <coughs> sorry, I think this idea was one of the, I don't know how to say, but I think in the last five or six years, this was one of the most revolutionary ideas in transfer learning, at least. Uh, to me, at least it's compared uh, in some way, even to the invention of the GANs. Because the idea is very beautiful, very simple uh, in some ways to, to understand for anybody. So what happens here is the paper was called the unsurprised dominant adaptation by back propagation. Uh, in this particular case, uh, what the authors proposed was to, uh, to, to, to use the neural network and to add an additional head to this neural network that will be predicting the label of the domain of the images that were passing through this neural network. So on one hand, you you use your traditional head that predicts the class of the label over the source data and over the target data. And on the other hand, you have what we will call the domain classifier that will be uh, distinguishing between the source and target samples. So the idea here would be to say that the set of the features that I'll be learning will be um, will be shared for both these tasks. So I will be learning a good classifier for based on these features, and I will be also using these features to compare the samples from the two domains and to predict one single output, which will be to a label of the domain that I'll, uh, this image comes from. So what I'll be uh, trying to do next is that I'll be trying to minimize the loss or the classification loss or the data that I have, and I'll try to maximize the error of predicting the domain label. And this is what we call the gradient reversal layer. So and contrary to what Mark explained to you when you do gradient descent, you move in the opposite direction. Here you will be moving in the direction that maximizes the error. And so this is the adversarial strategy in, the, in these exact terms. Everything that we call adversarial has some min max formulation behind it. Here we will be minimizing, looking for a representation for the data that minimizes the source error while maximizing the confusability between the two domains for the feature representation that makes two domains impossible to distinguish, impossible to predict for a classifier from which domain this particular image comes from. And this is a very beautiful idea uh, for one simple reason, because it follows exactly the theory that I was mentioning before and I decided to, uh, to skip somewhat in the, the technical details on that. But this theory actually is based on uh, what we call the H delta H divergence, which is um, calculated based on the error of the best classifier that differentiates between the target and source samples. So how it works is that if my domains are very, sim uh, very different, like on the image on the left uh, in the upper corner, then I can easily find a classifier that will separate the two. If my two domains are very close and they were confused, then it becomes really hard to distinguish the two and my classifier telling me whether it's a source that sample or a target sample will make lots of mistakes. This was the idea that was introduced uh, in the, from a theoretical point of view, and the, <clears throat> this domain classifier idea 
is based exactly on, on that. It tries to maximize the error uh, to bring it as um, to bring it as close as possible to 0 0.5, to random guessing of uh, whether the sample comes from the source or the target domain. Some results about that. So uh, one important thing that uh, you may notice is that uh, it's something that I've never, I didn't explain so far is that there are not only deep learning approaches in domain adaptation, there are also some shallow ones. Uh, but nowadays, I think that the gap between the two starts to increase considerably. So that's what but some of those that I mentioned here, you can see that, yeah, the first two lines, for instance, those, those were the state of the art approaches in domain adaptation. Uh, in the beginning, then we are slowly uh, they were slowly replaced by deep learning approaches, uh, and you can see that even the gap between the decaf features that I showed in the beginning and this approach is rather important. So you you gain uh, uh, up to 10, 15 points sometimes. And at that point, it was a state of the art method in domain adaptation, and I think that everything that was done after that to push the boundaries of transfer learning in terms of the performance. Uh, followed this exact approach. Uh, I don't think that there were other approaches, uh, that there are other approaches uh, that are based on some different reasoning for transfer learning uh, than the adversarial strategy here nowadays. Okay, so other methods, some simple ones, uh, just to finish this part. Reweighting methods estimate the ratio between the marginal distributions to define what points from the source domain are important. And then you reweight the loss that you try to optimize. So, for instance, on these images, I see that there is some shared part. Uh, some points lie in the same area. So, if I from from the both domain, so if I eliminate the points from the source domain that do not lie in the area of the high density for the target domain, then I'll be I'll be able to learn a classifier that will be good for both domains. So, this is one. Uh, First, probably an uh, example of uh, <clears throat> domain adaptation for the covariate shift problem published as uh, as early in, as in 2001. Uh, other shallow representation learning methods, uh, other than deep learning methods, uh, learning the new data representation, aligning the source and target data, like the subspace alignment proposed in in uh, by. Uh, the researchers from our laboratory and many different variations around these uh, subspace based methods, uh, moment matching methods, landmark based methods, etc. Those are, uh, it was a very considerable amount of work that was done in this direction um, without taking in, uh, without working with deep neural networks in particular. And that are still, uh, if you provide them good feature representations, they are still as efficient as the deep neural networks. And the last uh, family of methods that we are not going, we will not be considering in detail are the adjusting mismatch models methods. Um, those models, they adopt the classifier uh, iteratively or after the classifier was learned from the source domain to the target domain. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes it has an advantage of the fact that uh, you do not need to know the source data. You, you just simply need to know the source uh, classifier whatever the classifier, that classifier will be, the target data, you adapt based only on that. So in terms of the privacy concerns or stuff like this, it may be a very interesting option to consider as well. And this is pretty much it for the technical part. I'd like to uh, switch to the, to the real world example that we were working on when uh, I was in Kaitis, but uh, in Sado Lyon. Uh, which is a medical imaging example. This was a joint work with uh, Carole L'Artisan and um, <coughs> Alors Gautron, who is now a postdoc, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gautron. So uh, what was the problem? Uh, something that can happen quite often in, in the medical imaging, uh, the hospital, the, I think it was the, uh, hospice, um, I don't remember which hospital that was, I think Hospice de Lyon maybe, they had a scanner on which they were acquiring the prostate images to for the radiologist to just decide whether there is some cancer tissue in those images or not. So the first scanner was uh, 1.5 Tesla. 1.5 Tesla refers to the resolution of the images that you get basically. And then that scanner was replaced by a newer scanner, three Tesla scanner, which increased the resolution of the images. And the images you can see it even visually 
they have a they have a significant difference in the appearance, and as we've seen it before, uh, this will in, inevitably lead to some uh, troubles when you will try to learn a classifier on one sort of images and apply it further in the other. Uh, the data that you were dealing with uh, and the task that the task was the, that of the binary classification, cancer or non-cancer. Uh, there were some uh, manually extracted features from the data based on the image characteristics, based on the 3D pixels uh, in some way, because all the images also are the slices of the prostate, and the prostate was reconstructed from the slices. Uh, almost half a million uh, 3D pixels in one domain, one million in the other domain. Uh, the imbalance between the classes, but not between the domains, so we don't talk about the target shift here. And visually plotting, uh, like in the real world, when you want to check, you have only 95 features, you want to check whether there is a shift, you just plot the density estimation of the features, and you can see that there is a clearly, uh, there are some features that are clearly shifted between the two domains, and you sort of uh, guess that there will be trouble if you try to uh, learn on one uh, on 1.5 Tesla images and deploy it on three Tesla images. And this is what uh, was happening when you were trying to do that. Uh, this is the image on the left, the input image in the middle, the ground truth, and on the right, the prediction, when you learn the model on the 1.5 Tesla images and you deploy it on three Tesla images. So you completely fail on uh, discovering the, the cancer in this particular image, which is a uh, which is a very uh, sad thing to do uh, if you plan to, to use those kind of methods in, the, in practicing the cl clinical investigations. So what we try to do is we try to identify uh, the features that were contributing to the shift between the two domains. Basically, uh, doing some feature selection for domain adaptation, that's how we've seen it. Why we wanted to do that? Because this is an interpretable way of eliminating the shift between the two data sets. We wanted to know what particular uh, uh, what was the source of this shift between the two domains? Not some, not learning some new data representation that has nothing to do with the original data, but trying to figure out what was wrong with the initial data in the first place. And that's how what we've done. I will not be going into the details on that. Uh, just to show you some ideas of how that works in uh, in practice. What we were seeing is that our classifier. Uh, when we did no transfer and we simply applied the classifier from the source domain to the target domain, was predicting, uh, I was making random predictions, basically uh, the backer, it was predicting almost uh, uh, no cancer for all the images. And then I've seen that uh, doing the feature selection, uh, sort of like um, sorting the features in the decreasing order in terms of the uh, shiftness between the two domains uh, allowed us to see that there was a, only uh, a couple of features that were very shifted while the others were perfectly fine. And they allowed uh, by transferring the classifier from one domain to the other to maintain a reasonable level of performance of around 80%, something like this, which is not sufficient, but yeah, it was just the first step. And we were able to actually uh, identify those. There were only three features, uh, very simple, uh, real world problem where you can actually uh, correct for the shift uh, in the in a very simple way and eliminate those features that change when you change the resolution of the images. Yeah, so this is a quick example of some real world problem uh, from the first hand experience of working on this problem. And I think I'll be uh, going to the conclusions now. <coughs> Sorry. Conclusions, yes. So. Very active domain uh, with lots of methods. I didn't cover even 2% uh, of uh, the domain adaptation transfer learning methods. I didn't talk about many different flavors of uh, domain adaptation methods, many different scenarios. I didn't go deep into the theory of domain adaptation. I didn't, uh, <clears throat> I didn't explain you why domain adaptation is very hard, even in, in the simplest cases. I didn't show, I didn't show you what were the other impossibility theorems for domain adaptation and the pitfalls. This was just a scratch on the surface of this uh, of this topic. What you need to remember, take away message from the algorithmic part, is that whatever the algorithm you consider, it will always do the same. It will try to move closer to the distributions of the two domains while ensuring good accuracy on the label data that you have. 
the, the data representation that you consider is extremely important. Um, some data representations from the computer vision community can deal uh, when when you when you use deep neural networks, for instance, when can deal with this uh, slight shift between the two domains as we've seen it before. Sometimes the adaptation can be done on this level. Other ideas, once again, uh, of aligning good data representation makes the problem much easier. Many different divergence measures. I didn't go deeper into the comparison of those. Uh, I think Mark will talk about that at least for the uh, for what concerns the Wasserstein distance. But once again, uh, finding the way the right divergence measure between the two domains is extremely important because it uh, first of all, some of them will work in some, only in some particular cases. Second of all, uh, some of them take into account richer information about the shift between the two domains that others do not capture. So this is an extremely important topic as well. Um, some things that still I didn't cover and didn't even mention and something that is still uh, in the process of being done, uh, understanding the negative transfer of recognizing what is harmful for the transfer, something that people do not do much. They just uh, concentrate on improving the performance without understanding what would have been if we were to um, sort of uh, to do the no what, what will be the difference between the no transfer harmful performance and the adapt adaptation uh, beneficial performance? You can put it like this. Model selection, very hard topic. Uh, no particular contributions that I would like to mention here. I, I'm not personally convinced, but what exists, so I don't like to, to to present it. And I think that from the theoretical point of view, the few model selection strategies in unsupervised domain adaptation, they do not. Uh, they do not appear very sound. Heterogeneous DA uh, domain adaptation, when you have uh, different um, dimensions of the data that you consider, once again, uh, in this problem, you cannot, it's not even the problem of uh, having a drop in the performance. It's even the problem of uh, actually uh, putting the new data as an input to your deep neural network, to your learning method. And in this case, you, uh, you can imagine obviously some simple techniques like PCA, but uh, the practice shows that heterogeneous DA is a much more complicated problem, and the performance gap in this case is uh, even uh, even wider. And all, 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 all the cases of uh, derived from the transfer learning, like lifelong learning, uh, meta learning, continuous learning, uh, multi-source learning, multi-task learning, all those are closely related, uh, even though we cannot say that uh, multitask learning is derived from uh, transfer learning. It's, it was proposed earlier than transfer learning, but all those interconnected areas where you can, uh, where the transfer learning ideas find their application, basically, uh, they're also very interesting to consider. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. If you want to know more about the theory of domain adaptation, we uh, we wrote a book about that and there is a survey on the internet uh, that you can uh, consult. There is also uh, my article on Medium explaining the transfer learning uh, without any mess behind it. So if you want to check it out, uh, you're welcome to. And uh, thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions after one hour and a half, do not hesitate to pour them on, on me.